So, here to date, what would uh, I be stressing? We had a significant drop in the US dollar index. The US dollar index is made up of uh, six major currencies, uh, trade weighted, so a, a little more than half of it is actually uh, the euro that makes up the dollar index. So we had a drop of the dollar index by 6.1% as the Trump rally deflated. So a lot of optimism when President Trump came to power that he would be able uh, to lower taxes, uh, deregulate the US economy, maybe lead to faster growth. Uh, this we have seen that uh, a new president has been facing some hurdles in that respect and I think that played an important uh, part for the dollar giving back really the gains that it made uh, a little before the US election and uh, during the last uh, couple of months of uh, 2016. The euro, on the other hand, is uh, doing uh, better than the US dollar. We had uh, tapering by the ECB, which means they are buying less government and uh, corporate bonds every month. And there are hopes that monetary policy is going to start tightening eventually. Maybe not immediately, but eventually this is going to happen. And the Eurozone data has been mostly positive. Now, uh, I would also uh, say that in the background, two other elements that are very important in the big picture. We had risk on, so we are going to look how positive the stock markets were during the first half. And we also had a weakness in the oil price, despite all these efforts by uh, OPEC uh, to try to uh, cut output and boost the oil prices. However, the, despite these weakness commodities, we had commodity currencies being positive. Commodity currencies, we're talking about the, the Kiwi, the Aussie, and uh, the Looney, the New Zealand, um, Australian, and Canadian dollars. So, as you can see, just uh, some major currencies, we see a very big gain by the Euro, Euro USD up 8.4%. That's a significant move, mind you. It's not uh, something that, uh, and we haven't seen that for a while, for a long time, actually, the Euro gaining so strongly uh, against the US dollar. We had uh, uh, gold also rising. I think it's more a reflection of dollar weakness rather than uh, anything uh, special by gold. Aussie also positive, the Nikkei in Japan up, copper not doing so badly, even sterling with its uh, woes has been up against the US dollar, but not as much as the euro, mind you. And we are seeing this commodity index up, down, sorry, almost 10%, and also WTI, uh, that's the crude oil, in that crude oil uh, futures, down 17.4%. Now, as regards the broader picture, emerging market uh, stocks, so these are uh, stock markets in the developing countries, outperformed developed ones despite the threat of uh, Fed tightening, and we did have two Fed uh, rate hikes. So, uh, it was an excellent first half for stocks. There are, of course, lingering concerns that stocks are overvalued and that we are going to see a big correction or that there might be a bubble in asset markets. Not too, people are not too worried about this, but uh, we have to be uh, cautious and uh, mention this. Uh, bond yields generally increased as uh, central banks uh, could limit stimulus going forward. So less stimulus means that interest rates are going to go up and especially long-term rates because, you know, these central banks, they have been buying a lot of bonds in their quantitative easing programs. So if they are going to stop that, we are going to see higher bond yields. And commodities, we said they are under pressure. So this is the... Uh, I would uh, point here to how well MSCI Asia X Japan did, 20%, that's a massive gain. Emerging equities 
at 15.5%. Uh, Developed equities, smaller gains, but still very substantial. I mean, uh, to be up 9% uh, in the in major stock markets for the first six months is a, a very successful period for investors. And we had an increase in uh, bond yields, an increase in 10-year guild yields. 10-year treasury yields, they went up. Uh, quite a bit uh, when uh, in the aftermath of Trump's election they did not really extend their uh, uh, this positive move and we are seeing that actually the worst performing commodity was uh, soft commodities here we are talking about agriculture uh, commodities um, the MSCI is the Morgan Stanley Capital International Index these are broad uh, broad uh, stock indices so uh, these are measures of uh, indices that uh, they may not be the Dow Jones or the S&P 500 or the FTSE that everybody knows but they are used by fund managers uh, to have a benchmark and to check uh, their performance so it's for uh, mainly for portfolio managers who want to see whether their portfolio is keeping up with the market On to the U.S. economy. Now, the first quarter growth was not so great. It was around 1.4 percent. We have been getting weakish first quarters for some years now. So, uh, okay, it's going to accelerate for the rest of the year. We have expectations for second quarter uh, growth to accelerate. Overall, for 2017, though, not too high a growth rate of 2.2 percent. I mean, it's okay, it's not bad, but it's really not something to celebrate, let's say, growth rate of 2.2 percent. Headline inflation for May, 1.9 percent. This is the lowest uh, since November uh, 2016, but still, judging with the previous decade, it's not so uh, it's not so bad we are going to get inflation data on friday uh, just uh, keep this in mind uh, the federal reserve's uh, preferred inflation measure is the core uh, personal consumption expenditure price index this was up 1.4 percent year on year in may the fed's target is two percent so uh, well it hasn't reached the target yet, but the Fed feels that it has to move because this weakness is more or less uh, temporary and inflation is going to pick up. And this is what they're saying to justify uh, more interest rate increases. Unemployment rate was uh, up a little bit in June. We had uh, on previous Friday the employment uh, report. Wage growth is not as, uh, I mean, it's more than 2%, around 2.4% year on year, I think, but it's not, uh, the people would have liked it to be uh, stronger and to boost uh, consumption and the economy more. So, here on the top of the screen, you see the inflation measures. They have picked up, but, okay, not really uh, above uh, 2%. We were talking about the core earlier. This is the all items. So this is the headline uh, uh, PC uh, inflation. And this is the PC inflation here. And this is the CPI consumer prices. Unemployment rate very low. Non-farm payrolls are holding up, but wages, as we said, not so great. Now, President Trump has been uh, an important person. First, with his victory, I think he helped the stock market and the dollar rally. But now, it seems the stock market is still rallying, but uh, the U.S. dollar uh, has, uh, has been driven back. Uh, we had a, a major piece of his... Uh, legislative agenda was the attempt to repeal and replace the Affordable Care Act, or the so-called Obamacare. 
he passed it through Congress. We are waiting to see what's going to happen in the Senate, whether they're going to keep get to come up with their own plan. And uh, this has been a problem because without reforming uh, Obamacare, it will not be so easy to move on to um, tax reforms or infrastructure spending. So uh, there has been some trouble in uh, dealing with uh, with that and uh, some political problems. We have trade protectionism noises by uh, Trump. He will start to, to talk uh, with uh, Canada and Mexico about the North American Free Trade Agreement or NAFTA. So this is having an effect on other currencies. We have this investigation of Russian's involve, Russian involvement in the U.S. election. This is another headache of Trump and, you know, led to his problems with uh, firing the FBI director. Now they are after some emails with his son that the latest. So all in all, uh, he has quite a few challenges. And also we have a geopolitical situation. Uh, North Korea is uh, provoking the U.S. Uh, they are, they are uh, trying to get China to act. We have a situation with Iran, also uh, a bit fluid, and with uh, Syria. What is happening with NATO and the EU? His relationships, his relations are not the best. So this is what is happening with uh, Donald Trump. Overall, I think what, what we need to know is that he hasn't been as positive for the dollar as the markets thought during the, uh, the post-election period uh, last year. Now, what about the Fed? Uh, the, the U.S. economic data hasn't been great. It has been okay, but not great. We are seeing, uh, we did see two rate hikes, one in March and one in uh, June. Uh, now the Fed funds rate is to the 1 to 1.25 percent range. Markets are trying to see whether there's going to be another rate hike uh, by the end of the year. This is the big question right now. Today we had a little bit of a dovish uh, speech by uh, Janet Yellen. We are seeing uh, the dollar, uh, well, actually not doing uh, so badly, but the chances of another rate hike uh, don't seem to be that they fell a little bit. So we have this volatility and speculation whether there's going to be a, a third rate, rate hike this year. Another very key event to watch is what is going to happen with the Fed's balance sheet. And the Fed's balance sheet, what is this? I'll briefly explain. The Fed during uh, the post-crisis period was buying government and mortgage bonds with the quantitative easing, printing money and buying bonds. So now it has the challenge of what it's going to do with those bonds. It has to uh, give them back to the market. So maybe they're going to expire and not uh, be reinvested. So they're going to return the money, let's say. And uh, so it's this question, when is this Fed balance sheet normalization starting to begin? Because $4.5 trillion is quite a high figure. Probably they want to bring it down before the crisis, just for you to know, just as a point of reference, it was around uh, $700 billion. So these uh, quite a lot of purchases in here, and they need to come down uh, uh, to, bring, to shrink the balance sheet and not distort the market as much. Uh, now, uh, Trump will have the opportunity to appoint a new Fed chair. It could be Yellen, maybe she will be, she will be reappointed, maybe she will be replaced. We'll see. These are the purchasing uh, managers indices, like uh, these are uh, surveys of business confidence, and you can see that they are doing quite well, and uh, you see the big pickup, especially after the election, that we have confidence, but not so much reflected in the data, this optimism. And this is the dollar index. As you can see, it was uh, 
a good like during November and December around the end of the year it reached a high and since then it's more or less been going a little bit that was a negative crossover over here the 50 day with the 200 day so we are seeing the like steady decline of the dollar let's say pretty much since the beginning of the year or to the eurozone Eurozone growth rate during the first quarter was uh, very good. Uh, inflation not so good, around 1.3%. Uh, it's quite far from the ECB's inflation uh, target. Core inflation, which is more important, at 1.1%, also quite far from the target. Unemployment fell to 9.3%. This was the lowest uh, for eight years. I mean, it sounds quite a high number, but actually it was a, a significant achievement for the Eurozone and overall positive sentiment from the business surveys. And you can see the inflation in the green is the core, it's more or less stable. Uh, you can see that the headline inflation on the all items is a bit more volatile. Now it's, uh, it's around 1.5%. And GDP is actually, GDP growth is, is doing uh, well and Centix investor sentiment also very good. Now, with respect to the ECB, just keep in mind the main uh, rate is at 0%, the deposit rate is at minus 0.4% and the marginal lending rate at 0.25%. The asset purchase program now it's at 60 billion per month. It was up to and including March, it was 80 billion euros per month. And this is going to continue until the end of the year. We are speculating that maybe in 2018, the asset purchase program, which is a European version of QE is going to be revised. We'll see whether they're going to continue. Uh, the bank doesn't want to change interest rates, even the negative deposit rate at minus 0.4%. In the latest uh, meeting, President Draghi said that the risk in the region is now uh, broadly balanced, which is kind of positive, I guess, because if it's broadly balanced, it's more, it means that it's neutral, and then if things continue to improve, they were going to, they are going to tighten policy. And we have to watch the next meeting at July 20th to see what is going to happen, some, to expect some guidance. Now, uh, with the European elections, you know, there were, uh, things were looking quite scary. We had the Dutch elections, we had the French elections ahead of us, and they were afraid of uh, maybe a surprise result. But in the end, uh, both uh, the far-right uh, Dutch party and uh, Le Pen's party in uh, France had lost the elections. And we had, especially in France, uh, quite a pro-business, let's say, uh, candidate, a uh, pro-European candidate, a pro-EU candidate. So that was interesting to see that uh, the populist trend set by in the UK and US was not uh, so far copied in, the, in Europe. We expect German elections to pass without a lot of excitement in uh, September. Angela Merkel probably is going to win a fourth term. Of course, Italy is not so clear what is happening. If there are elections there, there could be the anti-establishment, anti-Euro five-star movement uh, going, uh, getting power, but not so easy to get power for that party as well. But certainly the Italian situation is not so clear. We had the referendum last year that was lost. And the Italian bank problems, we had the recent bailout of uh, two regional banks. Brexit is a worry for the EU, and also terrorist attacks, migration issues, and the situation in uh, Greece. So in the euro dollar, I would like to show you that uh, after April, we had a very strong up move from around 105, 105.5 to uh, 
114 now it's around it uh, was very close to 115 at uh, 114.83 now it's back to around uh, 114.09 so this is uh, interesting uh, and an interesting uptrend by the euro and we have a positive cross and if the euro manages to take out this 115 level then it's going to look uh, very good for the euro and uh, very positive on uh, to japan uh, slower growth there uh, around one one point three percent for the year is what is expected inflation also much lower it's hardly, I mean, uh, it's hardly above 0.5%, let alone the Bank of Japan's target of 2%, when that is going to be met uh, is uh, clearly beyond uh, uh, most economists' forecasts. It's looking at challenging. And the unemployment did rise to 3.1%, but it's still very low. This is full employment conditions, but uh, wage growth not rising uh, so quickly and this is keeping private consumption subdued so if you don't have wage growth you don't have a lot of private consumption exports uh, are up especially now with the yen uh, under uh, some pressure so we are looking at uh, inflation here spend a lot of uh, time below zero now it's uh, above zero and exports providing the usual lift at the time of uh, negative uh, you know when the when the yen is falling but at the same uh, time household living expenditure not growing that much just remember that the Bank of Japan is targeting uh, the yield curve. It wants to keep long term the 10 year yield at zero. And it's, it does that by buying uh, Japanese government bonds. However, uh, these purchases have declined a little bit. It's not going to, but it hasn't helped that much and we haven't seen inflation uh, rising people have been accusing the Bank of Japan that uh, it keeps missing its inflation target at the same time we are not really sure what the Bank of Japan can do uh, to raise uh, inflation I mean it's tried almost everything it tried the biggest QE program uh, out of all developed economies, still inflation is low, so really it seems that they, they are at the limits of what they can do. But uh, I am going to single the Bank of Japan out because they are uh, the most dovish, I would say, of other central banks. Because we have the Fed, the Fed is raising rates. In Europe, the ECB, the ECB is probably going to stop its QE program at some point, maybe gradually start thinking about raising rates. But in Japan, there is little prospect of the loose monetary policy uh, being removed, and this is hurting the yen, obviously. Dollar yen, you've seen that the US dollar has actually held up relatively well during this period when the dollar has been under pressure we haven't seen dollar yen dropping back to the post November the November election level of around 101 so this is significant on to the UK a little bit slower uh, economy uh, a little bit slower growth because of uh, weaker household uh, spending The pound has weakened quite substantially and this has hurt uh, purchasing power of households. So business uh, investment recovered, but still not enough. For 2017 growth rate of 1.6%, not bad given the challenges that the UK is facing. Inflation because of the rise in the the fall in the pound, excuse me, at 2.9%, it 
this is quite high inflation because keep in mind that the Bank of England target is 2% and the latest uh, business sentiment surveys not terribly brilliant uh, so and so I would say okay they're not negative but they're not uh, that positive as well the job market has proved uh, resilient and we have a little bit of weakness in consumer confidence and retail sales and this is a uh, this is wage growth, it's holding at around 2%, 2 percent, 2 point something. Uh, we have uh, unemployment and inflation. You see inflation here rising very quickly to almost uh, 3 percent. GDP, the week uh, first quarter, and retail sales. You see what is happening after Brexit, strong retail sales. Now they are looking weak. Now, Theresa May had her elections on uh, June 8th. They were supposed to strengthen her hand in uh, negotiations with the EU, but instead she lost her majority in Parliament. She had to strike a deal with the DUP of uh, Ireland. Uh, we still have mostly a hard Brexit. The outlook is for a hard Brexit, which would... Uh, uh, cut the, the UK out of the, which would leave the UK out of the single market, but they would gain control of their immigration. And UK services uh, are going to, uh, are not so happy because there is uh, the prospect of a hard Brexit and a loss of their EU passporting rights. These are rights just like citizens have passports and uh, they can travel using them in the EU. If a firm loses its EU passport then it's not so easy for uh, the firm to do business in the rest of the European Union. So this is a, a, tricky, a tricky part of uh, Brexit definitely. So we had the official commencement of uh, Brexit negotiations on June 19th and uh, we have David Davis talking with uh, of the UK talking with Michel Barnier. Uh, you can by the way ask questions if you would like but I will answer them at the end of our uh, session. I'll, so if you think of any questions and you want to put them down and uh, right now you can put them and we'll answer them at the end. So we have a little bit of a fight over the divorce bill between uh, the EU and uh, Britain and uh, we have some worry that uh, the UK economy is slowing down because of concerns about Brexit, because uh, households maybe are uh, over leveraged one uh, the silver lining in the in the cloud I would say is that uh, we have less worries in the about the about the Scottish uh, nationalist sp staging another referendum so it's not so uh, not as much pressure for a second Scottish referendum following the June uh, general elections Now, the Bank of England rates are now at 0.25%. They are looking like they want to raise them because we checked that inflation and it's uh, very high. But at the same time, uh, the data is not really allowing the Bank of England to raise rates as much as they want. They made some hawkish comments. Some, there was a split in the Monetary Policy Committee. But also Carney and Haldane, which are the governor and the chief economist respectively, they were uh, very dovish, but now they were talking in favor of raising rate. But again, we don't know whether this is going to be uh, possible because uh, uh, we, we don't see 
the growth outlook actually helping uh, the bank to deliver higher rates. But I would say that, you know, uh, we had this, uh, it bit, this is a pound versus dollar, it visited around the 120 level, now it's around 129, uh, so it's actually doing well. It tried a few times to break above 130 and stay above 130, hasn't proved uh, that difficult, but we, it's actually significant that we have a we had a positive crossover. It's the first time uh, since uh, Brexit that we actually had some positive readings for the pound. So in the first half, we can say it stabilized a little bit and it made uh, some uh, gains. This is the euro pound, as you can see, also within a range, but now near its highs and it could be that the euro could be trying to break out of this range. We can see here, and maybe this could be uh, this could look attractive for the euro versus the pound if we break above the like eighty eighty eight point seven pence or something like that. On to Australia. GDP growth in the first quarter, 0.3%. They're expecting good growth for 2017, 2.6%. I think it's the fastest growing country of the ones that we had looked uh, so far. Okay, not much competition because US, Eurozone and UK are growing and Japan are growing slowly. But from the major developed economies, Australia is probably rising faster. Now annual inflation is in the 2 to 3 percent band of the Reserve Bank of Australia and the unemployment rate is not bad actually at 5.5 percent. There have been some positive signs about uh, the Australian labor market. China is doing okay. We'll look at China separately but China is doing okay and this is supporting uh, Australian growth. Just keep in mind RBA cash rate is at a record low of 1.5%. We had the two cuts uh, last year. Markets were expecting the RBA to start thinking about hiking rates, but the RBA doesn't show itself to be in a mood to do so. It's worried that a lot of uh, households are over leveraged in Australia, uh, that wage, wages are not rising as uh, quickly. Also, maybe a little bit uh, worried about that the, the Australian dollar is going to become too strong. So, uh, it's probably keep the cash rate at 1.5%, uh, which uh, the cash rate, just for you to know, is just a benchmark rate. So, every central bank has one rate that is, uh, that is uh, it uses as a benchmark. And uh, for, for, for the ECB is the refinancing rate, for the Fed is the Fed funds uh, rate, so each one has its own uh, benchmark. So you see Australian inflation rising quite a bit, GDP doing okay, you see some volatility in GDP, unemployment also doing very well at 5.5% some employment growth as well. The Aussie, I would say, is looking more or less neutral. So it's, it's within a broad range versus the USD, around 77.5 cents down to 71 cents. So uh, we can't see really a, a clear trend with the Aussie. On to China, good growth in the first quarter, its best quarter since the third quarter of 2015. The expectations for second quarter growth uh, is at 6.7% and for the year at 6.5%. Inflation is in line with analyst estimates at 1.5%. 
and the yuan is actually a little bit higher versus the dollar since the start of the year so no uh, worries about uh, aggressive devaluation of the yuan but to be fair the dollar was down against uh, most currencies so business confidence is uh, above 50 it's kind of positive not too positive but it's, uh, it's doing okay we had the uh, good uh, trade numbers and uh, this shows a good global economy but also we are seeing imports very healthy so this is showing that the Chinese economy is also doing well now in the risks though we have to say, speak again about the very high debt levels of uh, of corporates and local government some state-owned enterprises we had the housing and credit boom so the in China what they did was to try to help the economy by uh, pumping uh, a lot of debt in the, there so this is now a little bit of a risk and we have a very key uh, risk event I would say is the National Congress of the Communist Party is a five-yearly affair I think it's going to take uh, place in the autumn and there we are going to see how uh, who is going to get uh, appointed and uh, how the Chinese leadership is going to change not the actual uh, president but how the posts are going to uh, change so you see with uh, with China good growth it only looks low because its base is at uh, six percent here and we have the PMI the business survey is quite positive exports also growing uh, very nicely and the yuan it weakened very much uh, last uh, the last quarter of uh, 2016 but since then it has uh, the dollar has fallen a little bit versus the yuan so that's interesting currently around 6.8 so one US dollar buys 6.8 yuan crude oil you remember that uh, we are talking about oil and uh, that there was this OPEC non OPEC deal to cut output by 1.8 million barrels per day so uh, this was uh, supposed to help the market rebalance but unfortunately uh, it's not rebalancing we still have uh, some kind of surplus and the output cuts were extended beyond the first half of uh, 2017 so they're going to run until the end of the year and then for another three months so we had this uh, we had quite a bit of volatility in, in uh, crude oil it made a low of 42 dollars recently and these are the projections so the analysts they are expecting higher uh, oil prices so they are expecting uh, oil price uh, to pick up from the current levels now this is an interesting uh, chart it's uh, very good because it shows you here in this line that the the US oil recount which includes uh, shale oil platforms in the US it's the number of oil rigs in the United States and you can see that it rose from around let's say the 350 level now it's around uh, just below it's around 750 let's say so this was a, a this represents a very big increase in US oil production so you can see that as the price went up this caused uh, this triggered uh, the price started very low uh, last year uh, you remember the rally that we had in the oil market but this caused US oil producers to uh, set up in price and as a response you are seeing these are the crude oil stocks 
they reached some kind of all-time high, but they haven't fallen as much as OPEC would like. And they say that uh, unless we see some sustained drop of these uh, crude oil uh, levels uh, in the U.S., the price is not going to uh, rise. So this is very interesting just to know and that the, the red is the Brent crude and the yellow is the NYMEX WTI. So an interesting picture. Gold is up 5.2% uh, year to date despite the significant losses it has had uh, in recent weeks. And uh, we had a lot of worries uh, about what was going to happen in Europe. They didn't materialize. Uh, it's not far above the $1,200 an ounce level. It's successfully defending it because it's at $1,222 right now. The eight-month high on uh, June 6 was $1,295. So quite a bit of volatility. We have risk remaining and gold could do well because we could have volatility in stocks. Uh, we have uh, what is happening with Trump, the uncertainty in the U.S. North Korea, of course, is making noises. Iran, Syria, what is going on too with Greece and uh, Italy in the Eurozone. So gold uh, is not losing, let's say, its uh, shine, despite the very big increase in stocks. And when stocks are going up, people tend to sell uh, gold. And of course, it also tracks the U.S. dollar. So when the dollar is uh, going uh, up or down, gold is going down or up. So, and here you can see uh, gold's correlation with the U.S. 10-year Treasury yield. Uh, it's tracking very good. It's the long-term interest rate in the United States, and also uh, you can see. The 10-year yield in the U.S. is also very important for dollar-yen. Just uh, keep this in mind. Uh, it's a very important uh, indicator to follow. Now, just to summarize, I think that the dollar yours is fading from what we looked at, uh, at the first half. We have the Trump worries and the Fed is expected to raise interest rates slowly. The euro has gained uh, traction. There is less political uncertainty. ECB is going to tighten at some point. So maybe people are jumping on the euro train a bit early to try to uh, to try uh, to get in before it starts uh, rising on, uh, let's say, the ECB tightening uh, monetary policy. The pound is volatile. There is some kind of base, but it's very vulnerable to Brexit and the UK slowdown. I think the yen is under pressure. It's currently the worst of the majors. And the Australian dollar, we don't have rate hikes uh, despite uh, economic uh, improvement. And I feel it has limited upside despite the uh, good fundamentals for Australia. Other assets. Stocks had a stellar first half, but we have these valuation concerns, so maybe stocks are good for the trade and they will be go up. You know, that trend is up, but uh, longer term with the valuation concerns, I'm not so sure. Bonds have been under pressure. Why? If the central banks are not going to buy as much, and indeed they are planning to sell some of the bonds that they own or that they are holding, this could uh, pressure interest rates, long-term interest rates up a little bit. Commodities, the commodities king is uh, oil. This is putting pressure on the commodity indices. And if we don't see uh, some reverse side in oil, it's difficult to speak about uh, some improvement in uh, commodities. Just as a note, I would say that uh, the problems of the oil price is not really a problem of uh, insufficient demand from the world economy. So uh, just keep this in mind. Emerging markets, they've had a very big rally during the first half. 
and this will certainly be interesting going forward what is going to happen there. Now, so uh, an update on what we were trading, let's say, or that we did uh, uh, so far. Well, we were a little bit more dollar positive, but the US dollar did badly, so we got that wrong. The sterling was uh, flat, and this was uh, neutral. And uh, this, uh, we were also a little bit uh, bearish on the euro, but the euro ended up going up quite uh, strongly. So let's say, well, basically, it was a wrong euro USD call here. Because it was at the top of its range, euro USD, and we said it would uh, come back towards the middle of the range, and instead it went to test further the, the high of the range further. Now, the US dollar is soft, was soft during the first half. It's looking weak versus the euro, and looking to trade weak versus the euro, but I think that it could extend its gains versus the yen if risk appetite remains positive. So dollar yen probably, I would say, can go up from here, but euro uh, USD also going up, but this means that the euro is getting stronger. Now, the euro is enjoying the diminishing political uncertainty in the eurozone, the good numbers, and the possible ECB switch. Will there be a sustained upside? We'll see. But this is what the market is uh, kind. Once the euro breaks certain significant levels, I think we could see a sustained upside in the euro. So we are very near those these very key levels. Now, the pound is more a two-way market at these levels. So it could go up, it could go down. It has stabilized following the Brexit shock. Now we are at levels that the market is more comfortable. But given the signs of some weakness in the UK economy, I think that it is more likely to move towards the lower end of the range rather than to break uh, over 130. Of course, whatever you do, you have to put place your stops and uh, and monitor. And so I think 130 is a very interesting uh, uh, level for uh, pound versus dollar. So let's now go to questions and let me remind you that if you want uh, if you want to send if you want the presentation sent to you uh, just uh, leave me a note just uh, tell me that you would like to to receive it and I will make sure that uh, you will get uh, an email now one of the questions is uh, how does Japan benefit from weakening its currency? This has been a stable uh, way to uh, boost the Japanese economy because a weaker yen means that Japanese goods, goods that are produced in Japan, are cheaper. So this is helping uh, the Japanese products to be more competitive and to be more attractive. So it, ha it was seen as something beneficial for the Japanese to uh, lower their uh, uh, to lower the value of the yen. Now what do we expect with the the pound loonie in the second half of the year? The pound versus the British pound versus the Canadian dollar. I think that overall the Canadian dollar has been relatively uh, bullish uh, there has been some bullishness for the Canadian dollar. We just had, I think, a, a rate hike by the Bank of Canada, if I am not mistaken. So, this is definitely... Uh, I, I think the, the Canadian dollar is looking relatively good in the is looking relatively good in the uh, 
versus the pound, which I have told you that I expect a little bit of weakness uh, in the UK economy and actually the Bank of England not being able to uh, hike uh, interest rates as they plan. So I, I would benefit the, the, the Canadian dollar versus the pound slightly. What I think will happen to euro pound? Well, again, we are near some critical levels for the euro pound, and if there is a, a break of these levels, then we are going to see some more some more upside for euro pound. Maybe test the ninety pence level, maybe above that. So I think it is looking a bit positive given that the UK economy could be uh, suffering a little bit, whereas um, the Eurozone economy, the indications we have so far is that uh, maybe the ECB is going to find it easy to remove uh, some stimulus in the future. The free trade agreement between EU and Japan, uh, if it's going to affect the Euro and the Yen on a short and uh, long term, uh, I think it's uh, it's for the benefit of these uh, countries, although uh, I think in the grand uh, scheme of things uh, for Japan, Asia is more important and uh, for the Eurozone, the regional partners and also China might also be a little more important. I think it's a positive for the Japanese yet, but I don't think it's going to be a game changer, personally. I, I don't think it's such a, a, a huge development that is going to change everything. Inflation is increasing in the UK, so the interest rate, another question, will be increased so that we increase the UK pound. I agree that is a good, uh, good way of stating it, but uh, it seems that if the economy is uh, weak, uh, then it is safer to expect that inflation is going to come back down. So any interest rate hikes, just because inflation is uh, up on a one-time shock to the, to the pound, uh, that's not going to be a very good uh, idea. So we will see whether UK rates. It's not out of the question. I'm not saying that this is out of the question, but we'll have to see. We need, I think we need stronger economic uh, news, economic data out of the UK because there is also the uncertainty about Brexit. Uh, there is also this one-time effect of the sterling because sterling is not going to go to zero. Let's say it had some uh, post-Brexit uh, losses, but it's not going to lose uh, more. Uh, I think we talked a little bit about uh, about uh, gold. I can uh, say a few things. Gold is also, I think, at rather close to 1200. I think from from 1200 to 1180 is not a bad uh, is not a bad level for those that are bullish on gold that are looking for uh, longer term uh, purchases. Of course, you should be careful with the technical analysis, you should be careful with your stops because gold can make uh, big jumps and if you are trading it, it's, uh, it's a little bit uh, risky. But uh, I think that gold is good insurance right now because everything is looking very good, the stocks are rising, they are doing very, very well, nothing uh, seems to be going wrong. So when nothing seems to be going wrong, uh, it's the best time to buy insurance. If you buy insurance when everything is going wrong, it's going to be, it's going to be very expensive. So yes, people will laugh at you that you're buying insurance when everything is looking good and peaceful, but uh, this is just to, it's the best one, time. Now,
again, if we see higher inflation in Australia, the interest rate will be increased. Just uh, keep in mind, though, in Australia, that the rate is at 2.1%, so the target is between 2 and 3%, so it's not actually uh, threatening to surpass the 3% target. Now, uh, China is running low on their uh, currency reserves. Uh, well, there was there was this problem, but I, I think that, first of all, they have ample currency reserves. And I think the fact that the uh, Yuan has managed to uh, make some gains this year, it's actually taking a little bit of the panic in that market and the worry that, uh, you know, there would be a pressure on uh, on uh, on the Chinese currency. Okay, I have uh, those that was, would like me to send the presentation. Just another question: uh, What is helicopter money? A helicopter money is another term for the money that is uh, printed uh, by uh, by the central banks. Of course, one way would be to spread them through uh, what you call it, to spread them through helicopters. But usually, what the, they are not so nice. <laughs> they are uh, the the money they are using to buy government bonds. Uh, to push uh, down the yields. So helicopter money is just a, a theoretical uh, construct. It has never been used, as far as I know, uh, to throw money out of helicopters so that uh, people will uh, use them. Gold is related to silver. Of course, we have uh, some ratios that, going back, uh, another question now, uh, we, we have some notes that are uh, ratios that have been uh, kept, but this, uh, uh, this relationship has not been a stable one. We have seen this gold to silver ratio uh, fluctuate a lot throughout history. Uh, but uh, what I would uh, say is that, oh, usually when gold is going up, silver is also going up. and of course, when gold is going down, silver is also going down. Keep in mind, though, that silver has a few more industrial uses than uh, gold. Uh, just to finish, uh, make sure that uh, you, if you would like to learn more about the markets and follow the developments, visit our uh, research homepage at xm.com forward slash research. We have market reviews technical analysis, uh, forex news reports, and of course our YouTube channel where we at XM Global, uh, where we post uh, our analysis videos, and you can also follow us on uh, Twitter, Google+, and Instagram. So, Thank you uh, very much uh, for uh, being here. This is the end of the webinar. So, thank you for participating, and I hope that uh, we will see you uh, in uh, the next quarter when we are again going to be uh, doing our roundup of the market. Thank you very much, and bye-bye.